All right, so fun story. Uh, I recorded this whole uh, reading vlog and then lo and behold, memory card, not in the camera. So second time is the charm and hopefully we don't need a third time. Chapter 14 of Crippled God, a great chapter as this whole book has been a great chapter with a lot of really great insights. Um, I wanted to read actually one of the first things said in this chapter, a reflection that harkens back to, uh, I think it was Drew Keir's famous, or I should say off quoted, often quoted observation about history, that all of history boils down, I'm paraphrasing, all of history boils down to three words, children are dying. It says, I believe in dead house gates. Um, and here in this book, we have a reminder of that with Bedell um, thinking, I am as true as anything you have ever seen, a dying child abandoned by the world. And I say this, there's nothing truer, nothing. Uh, again, just emphasizing Erickson's focus on um, the need to care for children. Um, and that that is a high virtue that is so often ignored by society at large and history in general. We get a quick check-in with Gruntle and Mappo. Uh, to characters that have been wandering now for quite some time. Gruntle, to be honest, I'm not really invested in. He's looking for his lover, panther, friend, person, who knows what that will end up being. Uh, more interestingly is Mappo, because this character is so well-rounded, even though he doesn't have a huge page count. Um, the pain of his experience is obvious and heartbreaking. And there's a great reveal in his section that the glass desert, which has really become a character on its own, like New York in a rom-com, is actually a that way because of a the Ivers, um, that is the butterflies, flies, and locusts that we've heard described by Bedell and the Snake Children for several books now. This de Ivers is part of the fallen god, uh, the crippled god that has caused this destruction. So we find out that even this very important landscape that has really like focused the last couple of books of our reading is shaped by the crippled god and as an extension of that a consequence of pain and trauma being rebounded off of someone into the world around them because that's again we've said this multiple times what the crippled god is um, so i love that even even the atmosphere around our characters is screaming out the point that Erickson is trying to get at of compassion. Next up, we have this conversation between Silkas and Riyadh, which is very interesting because it points out elements of the Elliant that we had not been uh, privy to before. We knew there was chaos and there's a lot of talk of like draconian blood and what it does to people. And this sort of spelled out that whole thinking that they will turn on each other. They will always look to cast down power and destroy power um, and enslave just chaotically by instinct. Um, and that is why they haven't risen or been powerful because even though they're incredibly powerful beings, they destroy each other. Um, and it is a helpful reflection of what we hear happening to the Tisti Leosin in previous chapters as they, they're, those with draconian blood among them are losing themselves to that draconian blood. Ublala, I love the continued like flashbacks to other lives of people who have wielded the dragon slayer armor and mace before. I think that's really cool and gives him a depth that he didn't have. He's always been a fun, really funny character, but now he's been given this added depth and grandiose feeling of like all these other lives and cultures and feelings. I love that. And I, I should have seen this earlier, but for some reason I didn't. I think he is going to be critical to the Karkonos shake. Um, battle against the Tistelosin and the Elians, or those with draconian blood in their midst. I think he's probably going to slay one of those dragons, if not multiple. Uh, I think that's kind of what Draconis is grooming him for. Um, and that's why I gave him that armor. I think that I'm so excited for that scene. That's a prediction that I feel pretty confident of, but we'll see. It's Erickson. The rest of the chapter is really this like catch up with the bone hunters from various perspectives, how they're doing, how they're feeling crossing the glass desert. It's bad, they're running out of water. There's talk of mutiny among like the regulars, even though the Marines and the heavies or like the elite troops are still very disciplined and ready to follow orders. Um, other people are not. And the Blistig saga is sort of reaching a zenith where he is starting to think of stealing water for his favorites and that kind of thing. And so that's 
I'm just nervous about that ripping apart the Bone Hunters. Obviously, I hate Blistig for what he has become, but sympathize for him after everything that happened in Dead House Gates. Uh, I think it's sad. And then the end of the chapter, it sounds like they have finally butted up against the Forker LaSalle. We'll see. Something is walking towards them. It could be a twist, and maybe that is someone else. Um, Shrook and that whole gang. I'm guessing it is a Fork or Sail battle coming at them. So we'll see how that goes. And that is chapter 14. On to chapter 15. Like and subscribe. Let me know what you think about this chapter. Thank you so much. First in, last out.